So Lincoln's plan is not congenial in some ways to the radicals. It, it rejects territorialization. It does not look for a social revolution other than abolition. And the radicals and Democrats say these governments are absurd. They would be, uh, Lincoln's planned governments would be like uh, pyr inverted pyramids, a pyramid on its apex. In other words, the base would be a tiny number of people. 10% of the voters from 1860 can establish an entire government. In Florida, a rather unpopulated state, that means 1,500 people. 1,500 people could establish a whole new government for Florida. What kind of legitimacy would that government have? But again, Lincoln is, tr Lincoln is interested in getting a state government established which will leave the Confederacy and abolish slavery. That's what Reconstruction is at the end of 1863 as far as Lincoln is concerned. It's a war measure. That's the main point about Lincoln's plan. It is part of an effort to win the war to weaken the Confederacy. It is not a blueprint for the post-war South. It is not, this is, Lincoln is not saying this is what we're gonna do when the war is over. This is what we are doing now. But, um, and also, this plan is not only not final, but it is not even comprehensive. In eight, in, meanwhile, this is going on in Louisiana, Andrew Johnson is running his own reconstruction policy in, uh, in Tennessee, which is quite different, much harsher, much harsher. He requires a whole series of other oaths from people, much more stringent than what Lincoln asked for. Uh, he does hold an election in Nashville, and when a pro-Confederate guy is elected mayor, Johnson puts him in jail and appoints the loser as the mayor of Nashville. So that's not a very democratic system, but Johnson is, just wants to get control of the government of Tennessee. He doesn't, he doesn't like Lincoln's plan. He thinks it's too lenient. People in Tennessee complain to Lincoln. They say, hey, Johnson is following a pl plan which is different from yours. Lincoln said, well, you know, I, look, I can't be bothered with what's going on in every state. Johnson is my man, so do what he says, you know. Lincoln is flexible. Lincoln is always flexible. He's always experimenting. Let's see what happens with Johnson's plan, which also didn't work. The main point about these plans is none of them worked. None of them succeeded in actually establishing governments which had real credibility as the government of these, of these um, states. But as I say, Lincoln's plan is a war measure. It is not a blueprint for Reconstruction. Moreover, Lincoln understood that for any plan of Reconstruction to succeed, it had to have support in Congress, because eventually you're going to have people elected to Congress from these states. And who determines whether somebody is eligible for a seat in Congress or not? What does the Constitution say about that? Who determines the eligibility of people elected to Congress? Congress. They can kick people out. They have kicked people out. If they're corrupt or stupid, no, not stupid. They let them in there for that. But no, <laughs> corrupt. Congress, Congress doesn't have to seat these. Lincoln can say, hey, these guys were elected. Congress can say, no, 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 no. These guys do not represent anybody. We're not. So Lincoln needs the cooperation of Congress to have this plan uh, go into effect. And indeed, later on, there are a couple of people elected from Louisiana who Congress refuses to seat. This is later, a little later in the story. But Banks starts enrolling voters in Louisiana for an election for governor and a new constitutional convention to abolish slavery in Louisiana. Um, but the, as in these other places, the pro-union party splits, not in this case over slavery, but about black suffrage. The free black community, highly organized, is demanding the right to vote in these elections. Banks does not approve. He thinks it will ruin the thing for whites if black people are allowed to vote. He doesn't let them register. And in February 1864, the moderate Republican, a guy named Michael Hahn, H-A-H-N, who is an immigrant from Germany, one of these, you know, not, not southern born, is elected the governor of free state Louisiana, as they call it. And, but the black suffrage issue keeps bubbling because now the Constitutional Convention is gonna meet. And in March, Lincoln writes a letter to Governor Hahn. 
in which he says, quote, this is Lincoln in his most cagey, he says, quote, I barely suggest for your private consideration whether some of the colored people may not be let in, as for instance, the very intelligent, and especially those who have fought gallantly in our ranks. The very intelligent, that's the free Negroes, and those who have fought gallantly, the soldiers. This is not a ringing endorsement of the principle of black suffrage, but it is the first time any American president has ever said that any black person ought to vote. So Lincoln, but this is a private letter. Han du, gets the hint when the president says, I barely suggest, he's saying, go do this, you know. <laughs> Han shows it to members of the convention, uh, but they have completely opposed. The, the, the Constitutional Convention meets in the summer. It's all white, it's all white pro-union Louisianans. They abolish slavery, but they limit the suffrage to white people. Han shows this letter and he gets them to at least include a clause saying the legislature can later expand the suffrage if it wants to. They don't give the right to vote to any blacks, but they leave the door slightly open. For, but, but as long as only whites are voting, it seems it's not likely that they're going to do that in the future. Um, although remember that little thing, and, and, because that will become a big issue two years later. Um, so even though black soldiers are guarding the convention hall while they meet to prevent pro-Confederates from assaulting it, almost no rights are given whatsoever to the freed population of, um, the, uh, of Louisiana under this new uh, constitution. In other words, what has happened, this is a reconstruction in which planters are still in control as they had been before the war, but now it's unionist or loyal planters, not Confederate planters. So, um, but in a certain sense, it raises the issue, a key issue of Reconstruction here. What is the fundamental dividing line? Is it loyalty versus disloyalty, or is it planter versus slave? You see? What is, what is the aim here? To get, restore the Union or actually empower the former slaves in some way, not just leave them under the control of, the, uh, of, of their former owners, even though everyone agrees slavery is now going to have to die. Meanwhile, General Banks, to win the support of local planters, establishes a, a labor system. Now remember, after the fall of Vicksburg, remember, the whole Mississippi Valley has fallen into Union hands. They control the Mississippi River. Along the Mississippi River are some of the great plantations, the giant, wonderful, great, rich plantations of the South, lining the Mississippi River on both sides, up between Memphis and down all the way to New Orleans. You see maps uh, or pictures, the fabulous wealth there. Well, slavery is abolished. What's going to happen now? Um, well, Banks sets up a labor system requiring these uh, former slaves to go to work for loyal planters. Loyal planters can have the army enforce labor discipline. If you're not loyal, forget it. You're, they're going to put someone else in charge of your plantation. Northerners will come down. So that's a big incentive for planters to say, hey, I'm really loyal to the Union here. Um, but so on the one hand, Banks says, look, they have to set up a school. There were requirements. You've got to set up a school on the plantation for the black children. You've got to recognize family relations. You can no longer separate families. Or, and in fact, you can't buy and sell anyone anymore. And you cannot use the whip for discipline. On the other hand, the blacks have to stay there and work. If they try to leave the plantation, the army will catch them and put them back to work. So this, this is the kind of apprenticeship plan. It, again, it doesn't satisfy anyone. The planters say, we can't make them work, because without whipping them, they're not working. And what can we do? They just say, I'm not working, and nothing I can do about it. And the blacks say, I'm sorry, we're not free. This is ridiculous. We're get, now they're getting paid a very tiny monthly wage, but they said, this is not freedom. I can't go find another job. I can't leave the plantation. So Banks', is, but Banks is plan, again, is trying to conciliate planters in Louisiana. 
But as this plan develops, and particularly with the Louisiana Constitutional Convention, radicals in the North become more and more disgruntled about what's going on. And in July or August, I guess, 1864, Congress passes its own plan of reconstruction called the Wade-Davis Bill, named for Benjamin Wade, radical Republican senator from Ohio, and Henry Winter Davis, radical Republican member of Congress from Maryland, Maryland, part of the revolution in Maryland. Now they have an abolitionist as a congressman from Maryland. And the, the way Davis Bill says, Reconstruction will not take place until 50% of the population, of the voting population from 1860, take what they call the ironclad oath. Ironclad, what does that mean? Not an oath of future loyalty, but of past loyalty. It's an oath saying, I have never supported the Confederacy. Well, there isn't a state in the Union where you could get 50% to honestly take an oath saying, I have never supported the Confederacy. So this is a plan of delaying Reconstruction enormously. It does, it does not provide for black suffrage. It does provide for military rule until civilian governments are established. Um, and um, it passes the Senate, it, mo it passes Congress, not because most Republicans are in favor necessarily, but because the 13th Amendment, remember, has failed at this point, and this will be the only way to promote the abolition of slavery. It makes the abolition of slavery central to Reconstruction, as Lincoln had been doing too. Lincoln, this is the only measure of his administration um, relating to slavery that Lincoln actually vetoes. He vetoes the Wade Davis bill, uh, or what they call, this is a very obscure piece of constitutional rigmarole, pocket, he pocket vetoes it. Congress passes it and then adjourns, basically. In that situation, the bill dies if the president does not sign it within a certain number of days. So Lincoln doesn't sign it, and it dies. That's what's called a pocket veto. He doesn't actually sign a veto message. He just lets it die. Wade and Davis are very annoyed. They issue a manifesto denouncing Lincoln for executive usurpation. But the whole issue of Reconstruction is now becoming more and more volatile within the Republican Party.